And so I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, John Hickey from Stanford University to all of you. He couldn't be with us here today, so I'm going to um, run a video uh, that he shared with us. And I hope the um, sound will be okay. Um, I might need some of you again to help me say it's working. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen here. And here is John Hickey. Hi, uh, my name is John Hickey. I am a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University, and I am a biotechnologist, a biomedical engineer, and uh, a researcher. And uh, I'm super excited to be able to share some of the research that we're doing. And um, sad that I'm not live. I am going to be attending uh, my my sister's uh, wedding. So, um, but today I'm going to talk about measuring hierarchy of and kind of mapping cells, creating kind of a Google map of cells. And but I, I want to start off first with a, a question, and uh, it might be a little philosophical, but how do you define yourself? And uh, maybe take a few seconds to what, what would you say um, to someone else when they ask you this question? Or what are some of the things that come to mind? And um, what I will say is it depends on a couple of different principles. And um, first, it, it depends on what you analyze or look at yourself or how you judge yourself. Uh, and, and for example, we could analyze for me how I define myself. I could define myself by my ancestry. Um, where I look six to eight generations back and most of the ancestry are, is either based in the US or uh, European ancestry, my genotype, if you will. You, I could define myself based on, okay, I'm a, a five foot 10 male, 155 pounds or around mid thirties. And uh, yeah, so that could be what, how I define myself. Or you could define me, and a lot of people who are scientists might define me by what I produce or what journal articles I write and what science scientific findings I produce. Um, another way to define myself is by my origin. I'm from a, a small farming community near some mountains. Um, or my state. I'm Today I'm not feeling sick, but maybe I'm feeling sick another day, or I'm playing basketball, or... I'm, um, you know, dressed up and, and applying for a job. So there's a lot of different things of, you know, how do you define yourself? And it depends first on what you analyze. And then the second principle is it def depends on how you analyze that. Um, so for example, if I, I just define myself by what I do and I can analyze that in a number of different ways at any one moment, I might be doing something else something different. So if I measure myself at, at one moment, I, I might be just working or sleeping or taking care of kids. Or if I rank them in order of importance, then, you know, I might say I, I'm a worker because I do mo spend most of my time working. Or if I look at this, I could say, I, well, I'm mostly a sleeper as well. So um, it depends how you analyze. Another way we could think about this is how do I define myself now is, is, as a trajectory of experiences. I, I started out as a chemical engineer and then I did a PhD in biomedical engineering and then I became a biotechnologist and systems immunologist now uh, with the research that I'm doing. So it's, it could be a trajectory of, of, of an analyzing this. An, another way we could analyze myself is comparing myself to others. Um, what are, we could say well, here are 20 different categories rank them from one to 10 of you compared to this other average group of people. And we could pull out what are the top differential expressed or top differential uh, characteristics about me that define me in that way. Another thing could be correlations, right? Or you could look at data from how many grams of chocolate I consumed a day and see that there's a, neg a negative correlation with more the, the distance basically to the nearest holiday. So um, it depends on how you analyze all these things to, to make conclusions and, and draw uh, a definition of who I am as a person. 
And then I would say it depends on, on context um, and especially the space that we are all in. For example, I'm in the Nolan lab and he um, is uh, a professor here at Stanford who has developed a lot of technologies. And because of that, I get to work with a lot of really amazing people that do uh, work on consortia projects like HubMap, which we're mapping all the cells within the healthy human body or H10, where we're mapping all uh, different types of cancers in, in a similar way at the single cell level and working with other postdocs on understanding how we deliver antibody drugs to our tumors, building 3D maps, or even looking at how immunotherapy affects cancers in, in melanoma. And that's just because of where I am in Gary's lab. But just being at Stanford as well, there's there's a host of technology development here. And so I've been able to start working with people doing machine learning or uh, working in microfluidics or, or microscopy. Similarly, you know, I here I am in the Bay Area, I start to work with companies. There's a, a large biotech hub here and also people who are interested in, in things that I want to work on, like CAR T cells or T cells for uh, killing cancer. And then more broadly, you know, being in the space, I could define myself as an outdoors person or an outdoors person who, who enjoys time with his family, just because the weather is always nice around this area and uh, it rains very infrequently and there's lots of outdoors activity or, or the teams that I cheer for because I live in the area. So I would say, you know, how do you define yourself? Well, it depends on what you analyze, how you analyze and the, the context. It also depends on um, time. And I think we, I, I touched on this a little bit in the analogy of, you know, seeing what I do over, over time, but um, you know, we can measure how much exercise I do and see that it changes over time. And maybe we just measure one point and we say, Oh, he, I'm, I'm good at exercising or, or not so great. Um, and similarly, it matters in terms of the, the length scale. And, uh, you know, we can talk about what, where I am in my career as a postdoc. And that is a, you know, a five year period versus a professor who that uh, many multi decade process. So to define ourselves, we need to take a step back and think about all these different things of what we analyze. Likely, we've said, oh, okay, we've slapped a label on ourselves. I'm a, a researcher or I am a teacher or something that defines us by what we do and often do for work. But um, we can be a little more innovative or, or in our thinking of how we define things. And so now, now with that introduction, I'll, I'll talk about now, how do you define a tissue or an organ or a cell or how cells make up organs? And that's, that's kind of the whole impetus behind this effort that's funded by the, the NIH in the U.S. is to create these multi-cell maps of healthy human tissue to understand more about how it functions. So we can look in and, and see, you know, biologically at a cell and see that there are actually networks that go on inside a cell. And these are based on proteins or other molecules that enable signaling within an individual cell that allows it to adapt to its environment and perform the functions that are needed. One example is being given here, but even at, you can go up a step further and individual cells can talk to each other and coordinate function between each other. So here an example is a T cell, which is an immune cell interacting with another immune cell, also interacting with a cancer cell. And, and there's this crosstalk between cells. And this crosstalk between cells is aggregated into little almost uh, micro cities where you have different micro environments that then build to make the entire tissue. And in this case, we're talking about cancer and how many different cell types, not just cancer, make up a cancerous tissue. There's blood vessel cells, there's immune cells, there's the cancer cells, 
there's stromal cells that help provide the the support system for the the tissue. So we can think about tissues and organs and cells all at the same time. Really, they're this multi-scale network of interactions. And we'll we'll talk about more how we analyze this and we think about this computationally. Um, But I want to present this kind of overarching figure that describes really how our system is built on many different hierarchies. And uh, this communication across each hierarchy is important and and linked together. But you can imagine that something like this would be very complex. And especially it's fairly complex to measure. And, And we want to be able to characterize this across all the systems and and be able to link these networks together. But a lot of our techniques currently in science only look at one level or one hierarchy. And we're looking at a single cell and seeing what it does uh, at this level and understanding the signaling mechanisms there. Or we're looking at multiple cells, but we're not looking at individual sig- signaling me- mechanisms in all the cells. Or we're looking at overall tissue structure, but we're not really focused on individual cells. So how do we quantify these interactions all at the same time? And now this is uh, kind of an impetus. And this is the question that I was asking as I was trying to transition from my PhD uh, in T cell therapy for cancer to a postdoctoral fellowship. And, and this motivated me to come to Stanford and uh, to, to start working with some of the best tech available. And what I want to show here um, graphically is this is actually uh, a tissue taken from uh, a patient that was cut and imaged. And the way that if you go into, you know, for example, if you have a cancerous legion, you'll go into the doctor's office, they'll take a, a little biopsy, they'll cut it into very small sections, they'll put it on a slide, and then typically what they'll do is stain with one to three markers. And those markers will say, okay, is, is this cancerous? And if it is cancerous, how invasive is it? And then that's about the the extent that they're able to ask with those markers. But um, here in at Stanford, they develop uh, our lab developed a, a new technology where this allows us to essentially paint the cells. So do the same process, but instead of one to three markers, we're going to fifty to sixty markers. So now instead of just saying yes or no in terms of cancer we can get much more granular and start to look at what are the actual individual cell types within this area and how who is close to who and who is talking to who. Now, again, this was developed in Gary Nolan's lab here at Stanford University. And, and what this technology might look like is uh, it starts off very Lego-like or, or you know, uh, electrical engineering like of all these individual components, but at, at subsequently he has commercialized it as a, a product. And now many scientists around the world are, are using this uh, tool. And how does it work to just paint the cells? Well, we have these, these things called antibodies and, and your body makes them to respond to viruses, but scientists have learned to use them to a, attach, basically paint cells um, that have specific proteins on them. And cells with different functions have different proteins. So we're measuring, we're defining a cell by the proteins it it express. And when we paint the cells with these antibodies, we can put a DNA barcode. And then when we want to image that with a microscope, we can do that by adding its complementary sequence and use a, a fluorescent molecule to look at where those those paints are, and then we can take them off and put on the next set. And we do that all the way up to to 50 or 60 markers. And theoretically we could go higher, um, but then cost becomes more prohibitive. So with that technology here at Stanford, we were focused on uh, understanding how the healthy human intestine changes over uh, the length of the intestine. And the intestine is a super important organ. It uh, facilitates digestion. It, there's a critical microbiota with the, the bacteria that live within in, in ourselves. And, um, but it, it's different across the entire length. There's nearly uh, seven meters in, in length. And 
there are some known differences. And, and so we're using that as a foundation to pick eight different regions across the small intestine and colon to study. And we, we have a team here to perform this multiplex imaging that I just described, but also to do other technologies, like look at the RNA that's expressed at every cell, to look at the chromatin, which is how the RNA is organized at every cell, uh, or the, the, how the DNA is organized and, and being transcribed, looking at the, the fats there and the proteins and doing uh, whole genome sequencing of all these samples. And these, these come from healthy donors. And so what, what this looks like for me is I get the tissue sections, I put them into array so that I can put most of them on the same slide. I stain them with these antibody paints that I have, and then I'm able to image and we do some single cell quantification and use these proteins to define the cell types. And these proteins are only expressed on certain cell types. And we have published a bioarchive paper. This is available for free for anybody who wants to look at it. Um, and, and this is not peer reviewed. The peer reviewed version will come out, but um, this is something that you can look up. So what is, what is this multiplex uh, imaging look like? The many markers all at once. And, and this is an example image that we took from an, an area of the intestine. And, it, and I think it looks very uh, art artistic. Um, I think a lot of science is art. But what you're seeing here is this purple area is the mucosa area or the area where there's the epithelial where it is basically a barrier between the inside of your intestine where um, your food and digestion uh, go through and the, in the inside part of the... Or, or the lining of the intestine. And here is a stromal part where there's lots of vessels to help bring in and deliver blood supply and uh, nerves. And then here up here is the muscle layer that helps um, promote digestion as well. And, and this area here is an immune follicle and you can see zoomed in here, these individual little circles are all individual cells. And these are, T cells and, and B cells in this area that are working together to promote an immune response. Maybe there was a viral infection or uh, it, it could be that they're just uh, moderately expanding here to um, that, that are, they're interacting with some bacteria. It's not clear what they're doing right here, but um, we can image areas like this. We can look at different other um, immune reactions that are starting to happen or resolving. We can look at within the mucosa different cell types that are present in between these epithelial spaces. We can start to look at the very bottom of the epithelial where this is where your stem cells sit that help regenerate your intestine. Um, it re regenerates uh, very frequently actually. So we can look at all that but you know, they're at the end of the day, they're they're just pretty pictures unless you were able to quantify them. And and through deep learning or artificial intelligence, we're able to develop algorithms that are able to find each individual cell and put a little circle around it. And then using that little circle or or cell mass, we're able to extract the single cell information from that. And we're able to define these cell types, just like I was talking about. How how do you define yourself? Um, by these protein markers, we are able to get the individual cell types. So, but now we have the individual cell types and we've defined them, but how do we tell or define other units or tissue um, tissues out of these cell types? So one analogy that I think is, is helpful is thinking about people within a neighborhood that, that defines a, a neighborhood. And these are groups of people that are located close together. And, and these neighborhoods then form together, spatially located next to each other, form what a, a county. And this county is then next to many different counties that forms the state and the states, et cetera. And so there's multiple levels of hierarchy that we can evaluate. What is the composition of people within you know, Manhattan? And what is the composition of people within New York? 
and, and so forth. And so with this in mind, this is kind of how we think about doing our cell type analysis and definition of, of tissue uh, units. So what we do is we go across our, our tissue, we look at individual cells, we, we make little windows, and we count up how many of each cell type are in those windows. And that gives us a, a relative sense of what cells are present or not. And then we have that mathematically and we can basically group ones that are similar and call them a similar neighborhood of cells versus others that are, are similar to themselves as neighborhood of cells as well. And here's an example of what this looks like with this fluorescent image that I showed you before. We can then identify the cell types based on the protein. And then we can identify these cellular neighborhoods. So you can see there's a lot of variety of cells here, but the, the conserved composition of cells with our neighborhood analysis defines this now as an outer follicle. And another thing that you can see is it's identified many of these cell types are, are close together, but these have become now the vasculature. We're, we're identifying these micro tissue structures within our data from, from doing this. And how does this look? Well, you can start to see this large heat map, which basically is the neighborhoods by the cell types. And you can see which cell types are enriched, indicated by the red. So for example, this one is plasma cell enriched neighborhood. And this is enriched for plasma cells and macrophages and, and a few other cell types. We can map this back to all of our, our tissues to start to understand the organization uh, and structure of the tissue. So we can also build on this. So we go from cell type to neighborhood. And just like I said, with going from neighborhoods to counties, to states, to countries, we can do the same thing, same thing with neighborhoods. We can go up a level and get broader sense of the organization of the tissue and even further up to, to tissues. And this is how we build these large networks and, and define an, uh, an entire tissue, the intestine, based on the cell types that are present, that are determined by the protein mar markers that then form multicellular neighborhoods that then coalesce into larger communities and form larger tissue units that perform basically the function of, of the, the organ. Um, so how can this tell us some biology? I'm gonna very quickly go through this. I think that my time is about to run out. Um, we can just look at one example. We could spend hours and hours on, on these type of graphs and, and pull out lots of biology. But one of the things that we pulled out was this adaptive immune enriched uh, community. And this is this orange one that forms at the bottom of the mucosa, which again is the area where we have uh, this intestinal stem cell um, area that's very important for regeneration of the intestine. And what we can do is, is see that this is actually enriched in uh, ad adaptive immune cells. I actually just skipped it. Um, but this is enriched in CD4 and CD8 T cells that wasn't appreciated before um, we did this analysis. The other thing that we can do is we can realize just by looking at this image that there's a, a layering that, that we can see that as we move from the muscle layer to the, the mucosa and through the mucosa that there's a distinct layering and organization of cells as you move up in the intestine. And we can quantify this through network graphs. I, I won't go into that. But once we quantify or establish the organization or the order, then we can start to quantify all the cell types as we move closer to the lumen or the inside of the intestine. And this is an example of showing the immune cell types as we move from the smooth muscle layer all the way out to through the stroma and all the way out into the lumen. And this organization can help us understand the function of the intestine and, and how immune cells relate to epithelial cells or, or the functional cells of the intestine. One example of something we found too with this was we saw that these inflammatory macrophages, so this is an inflammatory immune cell, increased with the BMI of the donor. And um, just to remind people that these are the different categorizations by the CDC for the um, BMI or body mass index. And people with normal had relatively little inflammatory cells, whereas those with that were 
um, overweight or extremely obese had much higher uh, inflammatory cells, suggesting that this uh, is a link, this cell type, to many of the diseases known to be associated with uh, obesity. And the, the cool thing about this is we can go back in the tissue and look at where these inflammatory cells are. And these are within the mucosa, which is um, where we're having our epithelial cells and many other immune cells. So uh, in conclusions, just remember what you measure in science matters. Um, also how you define yourself matters. Um, but uh, part of this is the importance of developing new technology and, and realizing that there's a need for funding for this. Another thing is how you analyze data in Science Matters. So you can have the same data, but analyze it many different ways, and it might tell you many different things. And so it's good for many complementary analyses, and this is why it's important to have funding for computational analyses or computational type research as well to complement the new technology. Um, spatial biology, like what I described today is really a next frontier for human biology and, and will pave the way for many new di discoveries. And uh, the intestinal organization that I talked about at the very end is, is featured by an immune cell layering of the intestine. And just would love to thank everybody in all the labs that I've worked with and uh, we'll pass on to questions. Uh, although I won't be here, feel free to uh, email me, thanks. Thank you, John. I think you will at some point watch this all and maybe get to hear how people define themselves. Thanks so much for starting with this opening question. We have a second speaker in this um, set, um, and I'm going to promote uh, David Van Valen to become a panelist here. Um, he joins us from Caltech, and it's a true pleasure to have him here. He's one of the uh, leading experts for cell segmentation with human in the loop approaches. And um, I'm very happy to um, collect questions for John. So please do post them into the chat. And um, maybe actually David can answer some of them. So the, both of these experts work in uh, similar areas. So David, you should see an um, okay. invite. Uh, are folks able to, able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you and I see your slides, but not in presentation mode yet. Thank you for coming in on a Saturday afternoon for a 24-hour event. Very exciting. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Today, I'll be sharing my lab's work at the intersection of biological imaging and deep learning. I would like to start this presentation with a 30,000-foot overview of the intersection between deep learning and the life sciences in general. The way I like to think about this intersection is in terms of the different types of data that are collected about living systems. Broadly speaking, there are three types of data that we typically collect. There's imaging data, which contains information about the spatial and temporal variation of living, living matter. There's sequence data, which contains information about the particles variation of living matter, which genes are present, DNA sequencing, which genes are turned on or turned off, RNA sequencing, and whatnot. And then there's structural data, which contains information about how biological molecules interact with the physical world to give rise to biological form and function. Over the past few years, for each, of the, for each of these different data types, there's arisen a collection of deep learning methods that can do quite remarkable things with these data. For imaging data, these are convolutional neural networks, which feature quite prominently in today's talk. But be aware that there are other flavors of deep learning methods for these other data types as well. For sequence data, there are language models that can perform equally remarkable feats with sequence data. Here, we have a figure from one of my favorite papers of the past couple of years from Brian Bryson and Brian He, published in Science in 2021, where they showed that they took a language model and trained it in a self-supervised fashion on a large collection of viral sequences. What fell out was a deep learning model that was able to accurately predict what, which mutations enabled viruses to escape detection by the immune system. For structural data, these deep learning methods include equivariant graph neural networks, flavors of graph neural networks, which respect relevant spatial symmetries like translation, rotation, and whatnot. These equivariant graph neural networks are key features of the deep learning models that have made transformative advances in protein structure prediction and protein design.
The previous slide provides the context within which my lab's work takes place. Zooming in more closely on imaging data, it's fair to say that new deep learning methods have drastically changed the relationship between life scientists and imaging data by making it easier to access quantitative information that's present within images. A collection of tasks, which used to be quite difficult, uh, can now be, that can now be performed fairly routinely are shown here on the slide. This includes tasks like cell segmentation, identifying individual cells and images, cell tracking, linking cell detection to events together over time and identifying division events to construct cell lineages, identifying single molecule spots in RNA fish imaging data, as well as some more imaginative applications such as restoring noisy images and augmented microscopy, inferring fluorescence images from label-free images. Concurrent with these advances in algorithms, we have also had advances in imaging technologies that have substantially increased the information content of cellular images. These include advances in reporters, which capture information about different physiological processes in single cells. Advances in multiplexing have led to new imaging platforms that make it possible to image dozens of different protein species and thousands of different RNA transcripts in the same sample. Last, we've also had advances in resolution, which refers to the collection of super resolution imaging methods that allow us to beat the diffraction limit. These two advances in combination create the possibility of images being a universal data type for biology. One advantage of this vision is the ability to integrate information across measurement modalities while conserving cellular identity. Let's say we wanted to measure signaling and morphology dynamics and then measure the impact on gene expression for 1,000 genes. To do that, we could simply perform live cell imaging of a cell on expressing a relevant live cell reporter fix the cells after imaging, and then perform an endpoint spatial transcriptomics measurement like Seekfish or Murfish. Because all the measurements were performed with imaging, we have a natural way to conserve cellular identity across these different measurements. Advances in commercialization and spatial genomics are making these types of measurements more accessible. A major challenge that is ahead of us is the, con the construction of computational primitives, key algorithmic building blocks that can perform essential computer vision operations like cell segmentation or cell tracking seamlessly across diverse biological imaging data sets. In this slide, I would like to provide a concrete example of what I mean by a computational primitive. Here we have a classic cell biology movie of an immune cell, a neutrophil, chasing a bacterial cell, finding it, and then eating it. We would like to create a deep learning system that can produce a narrative about this imaging data, very much like what I just described with entity level resolution. We can go through a thought exercise of what such a system would look like and what it would need to know. The very first thing you might want the system to know is the notion of what's a cell. It should be able to identify cells in each frame and know when these detections are referring to the same cell or different cells. It should also be able to understand the semantic or biological layer of information as well. It should know the notion of cell types, um, that these are red blood cells, that this cell is a neutrophil, and that these wiggling black dots are bacterial cells, and last, it should be able to understand interactions between cells. It should know that there are no meaningful interactions between the red blood cells or any other cell type in this movie. It should know that at the beginning of this movie, there's an interaction between this neutrophil and this bacterial cell called chemotaxis. And then it should know that at the, towards the end of this movie, this interaction changes into phagocytosis and that when this uh, phagocytosis event happens, there's a change in state in the bacterial cell from being alive to being dead. Essentially, what these computational primitives are meant to do uh, is convert these raw imaging data into a more interpretable format, um, which is the spatial temporal graph, where each entity uh, in, this, in this movie is a node in this graph, and you have node-level properties like cell types, and then edge-level properties denoting the cell-to-cell -cell interactions. By specifying things uh, in this way, immediately we can see where the different computational primitives might come in. Uh, we need a computational primitive for cell segmentation, identifying these cells. We need a computational primitive for tracking cells over time so that we know which cells, which uh, detection events refer to the same cell. And last, we need computational primitives for identifying cell types and then also identifying the cell-to-cell -cell interactions. If robust and general computational primitives are what we need, then the natural next question is how do we make them? This gets into the title of today's talk. While deep learning methods are essential to get them to work in practice, you need much more than just deep learning. You need data. This includes representative data models uh, should perform well on, in addition to the labels they need to learn from. 
you need the deep learning models, and then you also need the computational infrastructure for both model training uh, and deployment. In our view, these three challenges should be addressed simultaneously rather than approached in isolation so that one can harness the synergies that exist at their intersection. The challenges in these domains and their intersections can be viewed as primarily software engineering problems, which is the reason for the title of this talk, Everything in the Space Can Be Viewed as Code. With the introduction out of the way, I would like to share a few stories that we've been working on in my lab. The first story centers around single cell analysis, the problem of finding single cells and images. In our wet lab, we use live cell imaging to understand how cells process information about themselves and their environment. In these experiments, cells express a live cell reporter, where changes in the amount and location of fluorescent signal reports on the activity of a signaling pathway. To interpret these data, we need to first identify cells in every frame and then link these detection events together over time to create temporally consistent records for each cell. We can then query each cellular compartment for its brightness to convert these raw data into a quantitative interpretable format um, shown here on this slide. Single cell analysis is also a challenge for tissue imaging experiments. New experimental platforms can measure the location and abundance of dozens of different proteins or thousands of different RNA species simultaneously in tissues. These methods essentially produce n color images where n is a number between a dozen and a thousand, and each color corresponds to some biologically meaningful variable. Here we see some example data taken from a paper by Michelangelo and Liat Karen published in Cell several years ago where they profiled the tumor immune microenvironment in a cohort of patients with triple negative breast cancer. These measurements produced rich data for each patient, but analyzing them is challenging. One of the first steps in analyzing these data is identifying which pixels belong to which cells. If you can do that, you can query the brightness of each color, perform clustering to identify cell types and states, identify spatial patterns, and if there are outcomes data, link these patterns to outcomes. What is needed in both of these spaces are computational primitives. For live cell imaging, we need primitives that can segment cells, track cells, and construct cell lineages for commonly imaged cell lines. For multiplex tissue imaging, we need computational primitives that can reliably perform nuclear and whole cell segmentation across all the different imaging platforms in use and all the different tissues being imaged. To enable the construction of these computational primitives, our lab has been working for the past several years to create an image net for cellular imaging. We've compiled a large collection of tissue images that include both a nuclear stain and a membrane or cytoplasmic stain. We have also assembled a similar collection of live cell imaging movies collected with phase and fluorescence microscopy across a collection of commonly used cell lines. While data and metadata ingestion is ongoing, the largest challenge ahead of us is annotation. This includes the difficulty of labeling each image and the problem of scale, having too many images to label. I would like to show you some of the raw imaging data to provide a sense of difficulty of the labeling task. For tissue imaging data, a major challenge is cell morphology, which varies substantially both across and within tissues. The signal to noise and autofluorescence characteristics also vary across platforms. Some cells do not have a cell nucleus, which is an artifact of doing two-dimensional imaging of three-dimensional objects, and in some tissues, cells are in very close proximity. For live cell imaging data, the challenge is time. Entity level labels must be temporally consistent, while dynamic events like cell divisions and cell deaths must also be labeled. In addition to the difficulty of labeling each image, there is the problem of scale. We simply have too much data for humans to label manually by themselves. The approach we have taken is to have humans and AIs work together to solve the labeling problem. The challenge then is to create software systems that enable this type of collaboration. We have built such a software tool, Deep Cell Label, to enable exactly this type of interaction for biological imaging data. The software tool is browser native and allows distributed labeling of large biological image collections. Here we see a user labeling division events in live cell imaging data. Other modes of this tool allow for similar sorts of labeling for tissue imaging data. With Deep Cell Label, we have also thought about how human AI collaboration can accelerate the labeling of large image data sets. In a paper published in Nature Biotechnology earlier this year, we described a human in the loop approach to image labeling where crowdsource workers correct model errors rather than create labels from scratch. This approach reduces the marginal cost of labeling as the project proceeds. More data leads to more accurate models, which make fewer errors that require correction. We demonstrated this approach can substantially increase the labeling throughput. We use this approach to label a large collection of tissue imaging data. The resulting data set, TissueNet, contains over 1 million paired nuclear and whole cell labels from six different imaging platforms, nine different tissue types, three different disease states, 
and three different species. Labeling this data set took 4,000 person hours or two person years worth of work to create. Because it was done in this distributed fashion, it took substantially less than two years to complete this project, and most of the labeling burden was carried by the crowd. The time spent by experts was primarily on crowd management and quality control. With this large label data set, we created a deep learning pipeline called MESMER for simultaneous nuclear and whole cell segmentation of tissue imaging data. MESMER's best feature is that it generalizes across tissue, different tissue types and imaging platforms. Here we see a collection of different tissue images. And here we see whole cell segmentation predictions produced by MESMER along with the associated F1 score. We found MESMER to be so accurate that when we compared its performance to human performance, we found that it was able to perform whole cell segmentation with an accuracy that was on par with what humans can do. You can find more information about this analysis, as well as information about downstream analyses that MESMER enables, including cell type detection and quantifying cell morphology in our paper in Nature Biotechnology. We have been hard at work building a similar resource for live cell imaging. Here, the major challenge is time, as we need to ensure entire movies are labeled rather than just static frames, and we also need to make sure that the labels generated are temporally consistent. The size of our labeled data for live cell imaging is quickly approaching the size of tissue net. The advantage of labeling entire movies is that we can develop models for cell tracking and lineage construction in addition to models for cell segmentation. Our approach treats the tracking problem as a classification problem. Given a cell in frame I and another in frame I plus one, we determine whether these are the same cell, different cells, or if there's a mother-daughter relationship. Our approach uses graph neural networks to integrate information like appearance, location, and then the neighborhoods around each cell to create features that allow us to maximize performance on this prediction. Using deep cell label and this new tracking model, we have been able to crowdsource the annotation of entire live cell imaging movies. These large data sets lead to accurate cell segmentation and cell tracking algorithms. Example results are shown here on this slide. Visually, you can see that these models can accurately track cells and identify division events. The next computational primitive we've been working on is the spot detection algorithm for single molecule RNA fish experiments. RNA fish involves fluorescently labeling mRNA transcripts, which allows you to measure gene expression while preserving spatial information. Multiplexed single molecule RNA fish measurements, like seekfish and merfish, can measure the abundance and location of thousands of genes in the same sample. This is achieved by labeling the same transcript multiple times in sequential imaging rounds, which creates a combinatorial barcode. In this example, transcripts are labeled with one of four colors across six different imaging rounds to create a barcode that corresponds to a particular gene. The analysis of these multiplex single molecule fish imaging data requires robust image alignment, cell segmentation, and most importantly, spot detection. Approaching the spot detection problem with supervised deep learning methods is challenging because of the data. Most single molecule fish data sets contain too many spots for humans to curate manually. We have taken an alternative route and developed an approach to training deep learning models for spot detection with weak supervision, inspired by recent work in task programming. In our approach, we fine tune a collection of classical spot detection algorithms to a training data set. Each image has a set of labels, one from each classical algorithm. We then perform generative modeling to find consensus labels and train a deep learning model for spot detection on these consensus labels. Our benchmarking has demonstrated that this approach provides superior performance to models trained on either simulated data or data derived from a single classical algorithm. Here we see predictions on a raw image of which pixels contain a spot, as well as a regression prediction which allows us to obtain subpixel resolution. Simple thresholding on the classification prediction image then provides concrete spot predictions. We have taken this computational primitive for spot detection and combined it with our computational primitive for cell segmentation, as well as a graphical model that decodes gene identities. The end result is Polaris, which is an integrated pipeline for multiplex single molecule fish imaging data that requires no manual parameter tuning. Here we see the output of Polaris on MERFISH data from the terminal mouse ileum. We believe that Polaris will alleviate a major bottleneck that currently exists for spatial transcriptomic imaging data. The methods I have described today are only useful if they are shared widely. Last year, we published a paper in Nature Methods describing a software package called Deep Cell Kiosk which enables dynamic scaling of deep learning enabled image analysis pipelines in the cloud. The scaling is dynamic. As more data is sent for processing, the software recruits more computational resources to minimize latency. 
The software currently powers our web portal, DeepCell.org, which shows several of the models I described earlier in this talk. In my last few slides, I'd like to give you some thoughts on the future direction of our work. Looking at cellular image analysis methods more broadly, the way in which they differ the most is in how they represent the idea of what's a cell. A collection of different rep representations are shown here. They include the interior border background pixel representation using the original UNET paper, as well as the deep watershed representations used in our work. Currently, different methods choose representations that are best suited for a given data set. While this, this approach has been successful, it poses a challenge to creating universal models that can operate across different data sets. Moreover, there are challenges innate to this representation engineering. One challenge that exists are overlapping cells, which are quite common in live cell imaging movies. Representations that impose constraint that each pixel must be uniquely assigned to a cell cannot perform well on these imaging data. This constraint has impact throughout the entire software stack. Removing it requires changing the labeling software, the label formats, as well as improving the deep learning models so that they can pr predict sets of cell masks directly from imaging data without passing through an intermediate representation. Over the past several years, we've been exploring transformer-based models for cell segmentation, which have the potential to remove the need for representation engineering. Here, we have preliminary data showing that a transformer-based cell segmentation method can perform well across a diverse set of images without the need for, for an intermediate representation. While much work remains to make this, a, this preliminary result into a useful software tool, these early results are quite promising and provide hope for the construction of a, a foundation model for cellular image analysis. That concludes this talk. I would like to thank my lab members who work tirelessly day and night to create the results that I presented today. I'd also like to thank collaborators, Michelangelo, Leah Karen, Long Kai, Yi Song Yu, and Eric Osterman, as well as several different organizations for funding and support. Thank you. Great. Thanks so very much, David. Always a pleasure to see your work. Um, yeah. we, uh, we have I'm around quest for questions um, if, folks, if folks have them, uh, and I can answer uh, questions for myself or the uh, previous speaker. Very good. Thanks so much. Um, one question that came up in several of the presentations was gold standards. How do you create them? How do you pick them? How do you make them available to the community so that algorithms can be compared? Uh, that is a, a really good question. Um, I would say uh, there the, the, the best approach is just uh, assembling a collection um, of experts who are willing to donate a non-trivial amount of time uh, to the construction of these uh, of these gold standards. Uh, what's worked uh, for the purpose of bench uh, for the purposes of benchmarking um, what has worked well are sort of two different uh, paths. Uh, one is just assembling uh, a large amount of data um, that's done in this uh, human the loop uh, approach. And there you can view the labels that are generated as being, you know, sort of a hybrid between, uh, you know, machine labels and human labels, uh, because, you know, the two sort of have to work together to, to arrive at some, uh, some consensus. Uh, the second approach is to have uh, a set of experts uh, each uh, provide labels for uh, for a set of uh, for a set of imaging data. Um, and so what comes out of this are twofold. Um, so one is you have a collection um, of labels that can be used for uh, model training and then also benchmarking. Uh, the second is uh, once you have uh, comparisons uh, amongst different human annotators, uh, this really could, gives you a sense of what's the actual um, ambiguity um, in the um, overall for uh, for these flavor of labels. Uh, now, keeping the second path uh, going is something that's, you know, very time um, and hence, uh, you know, ca uh, um, capital intensive, uh, but it's something that we found to be um, to be to be useful um, when it's used judi uh, judiciously. Great answer. So as you saw, we had a number of um, presentations, including John Hickey's, um, arguing for the importance of cell neighborhoods and then representing those as um, cell graphs and ultimately as uh, larger anatomical microstructures that seem to be important for um, securing the function of the human body. Yeah. Are you 
working on that as well because most of the presentations so far were single cells identifying their boundaries even though they might yeah be uh we are we are working on sort of the i'd say the general problem of creating a, a hierarchical um description um of cellular images um and so part of that is identifying uh relevant structures at different length scales uh the neighborhoods are are, are one are one such uh one such flavor um of those uh, i would say you know here just sort of the, the entire space is i'd say limited by uh the the mathematical nature of the models that are being used uh to extract cell neighborhoods um and really it, it's just a, a limitation of the graph neural networks uh the way in which the graph neural networks encode spatial relationships um is through the structure called the adjacency matrix um you know which you know which tells you like which cells are connected to uh which other cells uh and the way in which that's constructed right now uh you basically uh, define like a, um, a radius around um, around each cell. Um, and if you're within that radius, you're connected. And if you're not, um, you're not. And while that has proven to be um, you know, uh, reasonably effective, uh, it just doesn't allow for uh, more sophisticated modeling of spatial relationships. Um, and so we're, uh, you know, we have projects that are sort of uh, along the R&D spectrum. Uh, what I presented today was uh, on Mesmer, which is, you know, very much, uh, you know, production grade uh, machine learning. Uh, there's research, uh, so uh, I say more research flavor of work that we're, uh, that we've been um, exploring on, you know, modifying graph neural networks uh, so that they, um, you know, they have more expressive capacity for uh, these spatial, uh, these spatial relationships. Excellent. And as we are in the production phase of HubMap, we absolutely need scalable production code. There is a question from Andrea Ratke. Um, great work, first of all. How do you handle difficult to segment cells? Maybe there are some which are on your list of those that are just yeah. particularly hard. And then what agreement do you have between human annotators on average? Ground truths can be very difficult to term to determine, as you know, David. Yeah. So I'd say here, you know, our, our overlying philosophy is to not let perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, and I'd say there's been a tendency um, across the this entire space to, you know, sort of hyper focus on getting perfect segmentations. Uh, but those perfect segmentations are often in the eye of the beholder, uh, you know, reasonable experts, uh, experts. Uh, Reasonable experts will uh, will disagree, and so then that kind of uh, that inner annotator agreement um, sort of sets a a ceiling um, above which you know the the improved quote unquote accuracy uh, you know doesn't really have you know that much um, that much meaning. Um, so to be concrete, you know what we do what we tend to do for difficult cells uh, is just have. Uh, try to have uh, criteria uh, as far as like how we want them to be uh, to be handled. Um, in which cases are you going to have you know a particular uh, should a labeler you know call a ambiguous cell you know one cell um, or two um, and you know we try to make sure that that gets uh, applied um, throughout the data set so that you know if the model is going to you know make a quote unquote mistake. Um, Oh, although you know that 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 term I would I would say is uh, kind of nebulous here, um, but it would at least be consistent um, uh, performance because that performance is sort of being would sort of be encoded uh, in in the data set. Excellent. I had another question. So in some cases, we absolutely must have 3D, for instance, when we try to understand the lengths, the um, angles for vascular yeah. lymphatic systems, etc. And how far do you need in your work 3D data? Uh, so, you know, we've we, we've built the software uh, platform to be able to do uh, 3D labeling and our algorithms are fairly, um, it's fairly straightforward to extend them to, to 3D, uh, to 3D use cases. Uh, I also have to highlight that there are, you know, deep learning methods, you know, that can do 3D out of uh, out of the box. The real limitation uh, for doing that is just the amount of available 3D data, um, and then also the the uh, associated labels for that. Um, and I'd say here, you know, you sort of you start running into the uh, sort of where the rubber meets the road, uh, because you know what this got everybody excited um, about this, you know, sort of the spatial biology space, which you know has folks like HubMap um, contributing, you know, non-trivial sums of money to generate these uh, atlases, is the potential of getting uh, data sets that have both the uh, the spatial component. Components, so X, Y, and then um, in this case, Z, uh, but then also the parts list component uh, as well, right? So being able to look at the uh, location and abundance of, you know, dozens to thousands um, of different um, of different genes. 
Uh, and so there, uh, we start getting the economics of how much does it cost uh, to generate uh, one of these uh, one of these data sets. Uh, you know, and I'd say like a uh, say like a using like a a um, you know take a, a, a example platform like uh, you know Murfish or NanoStrings Cosm uh, Cosmx. There, you know, for uh, a single slice, you know, it's going to be on the order of you know a, a few thousand dollars to do that. Um, and so then when you say, okay, well, I want to have three D data for you know a tissue block, well then how how many slices do you need, right? Um, and so it could be, you know, a dozen slices, two dozen slices, a hundred slices based on the based on the resolution. Uh, and there, you you know quickly uh, start getting uh, you know uh, projects that you know were previously feasible at the uh, academic scale uh, quickly become infeasible. Uh, there are other uh, approaches that people uh, that people have uh, have done to try to get at this, uh, but they all have technical issues that need to be need to be sorted out. If you're staining uh, entire tissue blocks, then you have to make sure that your uh, that your antibodies um, or your probes actually pre penetrate uh, through the tissue, and you need that staining to be uh, to be uniform. Uh, doing that is uh, non-trivial. There are a variety of approaches that people um, are currently work, uh, currently working on. The one that I've, I've heard of that's had the most success, at least as far as data data generated, um, has been like electrophoresis. Um, and so using electric field to, you know, sort of get the antibodies all the way through the, uh, through the tissue. Uh, but to my knowledge, uh, then there, there's also the, the, the imaging aspect of it, of it, of it too. Right. So here you'd have to do, you know, tissue clearing and then either some, uh, some collection of confocal, um, or light sheet imaging. Uh, but, you know, just broadly speaking, you know, the challenges, uh, you know, these methods just aren't at the, aren't ready to scale in the same way that the 2d methods, uh, can. And so that is a question of, okay, well, can I try to get, uh, you know, a, a reasonable, a reasonable amount of like good 2d data now, um, or, you know, spend, you know, another, you know, tens of millions of dollars, uh, of additional R and D to try to get the 3d, uh, 3d, um, data later. Um, and I think the consensus of the field is let's try to get, um, a, a good amount of 2d data now, um, and keep the R and D going for the 3d, uh, three dimensional data. Um, the end of the software infrastructure that we built will be ready for when those, when those, when those data sets come online though. So. That's kind of, that's kind of David, thanks so much for coming in on a Saturday afternoon. Um, great to have you on the HubMap team also.